All right. Okay. Welcome, everybody. If we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I just ask for the two indulgences for my colleagues. First, it, to wish Mrs. Gonzalez a happy birthday. If we want to do a sing, happy birthday no, no, no. to you. Okay. Happy birthday yeah. to you. Happy birthday, dear Mrs. Gonzalez. Happy birthday to you. My second indulgence. I might make all of you sing that again because I didn't hear most of it. My second indulgence is also singing related to everybody. I had the amazing opportunity to go see Notorious as they did their international competition in New York. I, my son and I went to that. And it was incredible, amazing. I cannot explain how outstanding their performance was. They actually took third place. So they put us on the map for I can't even explain how every single group that was there, t the top winners, were all incredible. So first of all, the fact that Notorious got there, it's just a testament to their right. work, all the work that they put in, the director, Mrs. Kane, all the parents, Mrs. Kane, all the help that they've received, and also every single group that competed was three different countries. It was, ch it was a championship round. Every group was outstanding, just high talent, highly produced, and notorious just, you know, blew them away. They were fantastic. So Thanks for it. congrats. Yeah. Is there gonna be a rebroadcast or is there some I think our clerk, Mrs. McNeil, whose son She's was in there, uh, she posted it somewhere. So I think oh. it might be either on the YouTube for Notorious or um, um, maybe Maskers has them. I'm not. I'm not sure which it is, but we should probably. Yeah, we should definitely have. They were amazing. Be good to see. And really, if you watch the video, you can't even explain the the excitement in the theater on Broadway as they were taking the stage That's and incredible. throughout it. Yeah, it was something incredible. to be there in person. They were phenomenal. It's a phenomenal group in there. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. They're all different ages. Unbelievable talent. So it was wonderful. Every group that was there was so, ta so, so highly was it, talented. So. Was, it, was it a little bit of pride? <laughs> I was, they weren't even my kids and I was proud of them, you know? <laughs> so they were just, they were fantastic. I cannot wait to see what they do next, you know? They're amazing, so. Even there's some seniors that are going to move on. They're, they're definitely going to have careers in performance if they want to. Uh, I mean, the sky's the limit for them. And just to see the next, the next group that comes forward, they were they were fantastic. So um, awesome. Uh, Mr. Mills, his son was there, was a performer. Just fantastic group of kids. So we congratulate them. Maybe they'll perform for us. Who knows? That'll be that would be a fun thing for us to to have Great. again. You know, and also I was told that t to acknowledge all the fundraising that the town did for them because of the people coming together in short order when they won from the time they won to the a month later when they went, they raised enough money so the kids didn't have to worry about paying their way to get there or stay there and just to be able to work at it. And that, that I'm sure was a huge stress off of you know, the, the families, how are we gonna get there now, you know, because it's not a cheap trip, so. So thanks to everybody in the town that also showed their support by contributing to it, so. It's nice to be known for sports in North Reading, but now they know us for music and specifically for Notorious, so it was wonderful. So congratulations to them and Mrs. Kane, their director, and all the parents that helped them get there on the way. All, good. All right, thank you. I just wanted to talk about that first. Um, now we're, we have public comment. Would anybody like to speak in public comment? And 
We don't, it doesn't look like we have too many people joining us, Mr. Gilbert. Did you see anyone that has their hand raised? Celtics are sitting. I see none here. <laughs> Celtics are playing. I see, see none in the audience either. So our next order of business is the votes to determine the useful lights of um, various departments. Police yeah, we're going to start. Police, town hall, library, and capital projects approved in the June 2021 town meeting. Perfect. Uh, it's a standard course um, of action for us. We are approving, asking the board to approve useful light for projects that is uh, longer than what is specified in state statute. Um, for all of these items, we believe that the useful life will exceed what we're asking you to approve, which is a 10-year borrowing term. Finance director is here to answer any questions that you might have, but uh, this is pretty routine and aligns the borrowing with what the financing plan is that's been developed by the Capital Improvement Planning Committee as well. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. Welcome. I don't know if you want to add anything to that or if you want us to go right to the vote on it. No, just like um, the town administrator mentioned, it's, this is fairly routine and we tend to um, keep these capital items for a longer period of time than what is, um, there's a whole standard out there for, you know, vehicles and equipment and, you know, different types of items <coughs> and buildings and um, so we typically exceed those, those lives, those useful lives. You know, we, we kept a bobcat for probably 25 years and not that I'm looking to do that, but you know, the amount of time that we keep it for and use it for and it, we have already set a budget with the Capital Improvement Planning Committee with the financing plan to, you know, have this as the set life and this is even shorter than how long we'll actually keep it for. So. Okay. Any questions? Do I hear a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the maximum useful life of departmental equipment listed below to be financed with a portion of the proceeds of the three hundred and five thousand borrowing authorized by the vote of the town past June 5th, 2021, is hereby determined pursuant to General Law Chapter 44, Section 7, to be as follows. Town Hall Upgrade Security, 70,000. Maximal Useful Life, 10 years. Library Upgrade Security, 60,000, 10 years. Toolcats, 5,600, 65,000, 10 years. Library Install Fire Alarm, 50,000, 10 years. Police Department Upgrade Security System, 60,000, 10 years. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Okay, our next order of business is to review the status of the fiscal year 2023 municipal budget, which we're joined again by Ms. Brock and I don't know if you want to begin, Mr. Gilbert. I'll, I'll also. let Ms. Rourke take it away, but we just wanted to give the board an update as to where the revenue plan stands. Um, the state legislature begins its deliberations on the state budget this week, so we hope to have an update for the financial planning team at their regular meeting scheduled for Friday. But right now, what you'll be looking at will be from the last financial planning team meeting two or three weeks ago at this point. And I'll just ask, just for, yeah, just for a quick update, um, we normally this time of year are coming in with recommendations to balance the budget, and our plan is to do so at the meeting of uh, Monday, May 9th, um, the next uh, regular board meeting. This just gives you a preview of sort of what the, the guardrails are right now that we're working with. That, excuse me for one second, just jumping back to the prior order of business, you have something for Mr. Studo to sign in the package? It's in the folder, right? Yep, it's right here. Uh, okay, forget it. We usually forget to sign those and you're no. chasing us for the I rest will, of the I week. I will chase so. you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so for the FY23 uh, municipal budget update, we have gone through our normal budgeting process with the financial planning team, which consists of uh, two members of the chair and vice chair of the finance committee, chair and vice chair of the select board, um, same for the school committee, as well as the school um, assistant superintendent of business operations and the town administrator and myself 
And so we begin that process typically around August and we move our way through with new information that we receive. And a lot of it is um, received later in the year. You know, for example, health insurance or our general liability insurance, those type of fixed costs. Same with debt service costs. You know, we're in that process right now of borrowing for FY21's approved, uh, FY, I should say June of 21's approved capital for FY22. We're, we're gonna go and borrow for that um, in the coming weeks. So we're finalized, everything is coming together and we're finalizing everything. We still do have a shortfall on the municipal side and the school as well. Uh, the schools gap, uh, you know, they have workshops um, at different time frames than we do on the municipal side. So they are working very closely to close their smaller gap. They had a bigger gap and then, you know, it's small and hopefully when we meet on Friday, um, as, a, as a team we'll be able to uh, have more information with an update of um, local, local aid, state aid, and we will be able to make some decisions. And as town administrator mentioned, May 9th, uh, we will come in with our FY23 budget recommendations. And at that point, we typically have a balanced budget. We have to make some, you know, sometimes some hard decisions, um, maybe some things that were newly requested for FY23 um, might not make, make the cut. There's about $520,000 worth of um, items that are over uh, a level funded budget and um, so we will work to see how we can potentially fund those items if they need to be deferred or if any of them are one-time costs that we can fund with free cash um, so those are some of our options and um, you know the first thing that we balance right away from available revenue right off the top for both municipal and school is our total fixed costs. So that includes your health insurance, your general liability, your debt service, your regional school assessment, um, you know, your OPEB liability, a wide variety of things are into fixed costs. And then we break it down um, to an allocation to the municipal side and the school side. So right now, um, the available funds for the municipal side is $18,821,950. And the municipal departmental budget request total $19,541,754. So our shortfall or our budget gap or our deficit at this point on the municipal side is 719804 so we, uh, the town administrator and myself, will work um, this week uh, leading up to Friday's uh, financial planning team meeting to see what, what we can, you know, fit in, what we need to leave on the side until we find out maybe, you know, some more available funds that could um, come to us and then, you know, we will have a recommended um, town administrator recommended budget can do you know what the school? I seem to recall fifty thousand is coming to my mind in terms of what they did for eliminating things or find you know to fix close their gap. Yes, so you are uh, spot on. Their gap um, right now, and I have not spoken with uh, Michael Conley, um, but their their gap is uh, forty eight thousand four forty three. And um, so what they were able to identify, 205,000 worth of uh, one-time uh, costs, and so those will be funded with free cash. Their uh, <clears throat> budget requests, um, and so let me just make sure I, their level services budget request is 35 million, 695, 396. They um, have a level services budget, a modified level services budget, and then a, an RPS uh, 2025 requested budget. And 
we have not been able to, you know, meet those other areas, but they have been able to move and shift some things around and with, and I don't want to speak for them, but I know we talked about it, our financial planning team, there was um, more full day kindergartens, remind me if I'm, you know, I think there was more full day kindergartens that um, they ended up with and they budgeted for more half day. Some, there was some shifts in, in that and um, then of course the one time cost that they had within their budget that, were, that we were able to um, pull out and fund with free cash. So um, those are some of the things and we will have a complete um, budget presentation on May 9th listing out, you know, um, we pulled out of the revenue plan, and this is this has happened in for a few years. The, the dollars that are set aside for the capital improvement plan from raise and appropriate, those were pulled out, and they'll be funded with free cash, um, as well as uh, retirements for both uh, municipal and school. And when I say retirements, those are. Uh, career and uh, by bios for, for uh, individuals that are retiring. So that will be funded with both free cash. So those are some of the things Snow and Ice we pulled out and we're going to fund that with free cash. Um, so, you know, we look for different areas that we we can handle um, with with free cash that, you know, logically we can defend that it's uh, an allowable expense under free cash. Okay. Questions? Comments? All set? <laughs> yes, all right. Thank you. Any other? Any, oh, we're all set? All right. Thank you, Ms. Rourke. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Are you so all set for tonight? Are you set? I'm, I'm set for okay. the assumption. So all right. So our next. Next order of business is to review the warrant articles, <coughs> which is on, let me just say, actually, I don't have the same packet as the Page rest of these. Right Mike, are we reviewing all or just the ones listed? Madam Chair, through you, yes. The intention was to review the handful of items that were not routine uh, articles uh, this evening, and we've asked the uh, petitioners to, to join us. Yes. Um, per perhaps most importantly, though, I should note for the board <coughs> and for the record that um, you have in your packet a communication from the chair of the Land Utilization Committee uh, requesting to, um, to withdraw the article relative to the uh, bike or recreational trail, which was the last article on the warrant. In the draft of the warrant that's before you, you'll see that it's uh, written in uh, strike through format. I have prepared a motion um, for the board to consider uh, to remove that article uh, at the request of the um, of the petition of the land utilization committee um, that I provided in the packet for uh, for Mrs. Sudo. So I don't know if we want to take that up first and then go to the items that are remaining, um, of which there are I think five. All right. So items one, articles one through twenty two are our standard articles that Correct. we typically would address. So we're not those are. We did talk about those first. We, re we didn't talk about them last meeting because they're standard, but you did kind of review those. And so now, what was formerly, I don't see it here. Uh, I do see it here. It, what was formerly Article 28 is asked to be withdrawn by the sponsor, which was Land Utilization Committee, which was the, the, um, the the recreational, recreational ra rail trail, which got uh, quite a bit of our public comment here, and it got quite a bit of attendees when land utilization reviewed the revised plan. <coughs> there were quite a few attendees there. So, is there any question from the board with re land utilization as a sponsor? They know it needs a lot more work to be done to it and they want more time for it. So they're asking for it to re be removed from the warrant article to give them the opportunity to continue their work on it, which is basically the rerouting or communicating, I think, with residents who are 
most affected by it, hopefully. So is there any question on that? I don't know, Mr. Studo, if you wanted to add anything more to it. I know you attended that uh, hearing. So mm, this no, they just uh, decided that um, they wanted to get all their ducks in a row a little bit more, <clears throat> and they didn't think they were going to be able to get it all done before, you know, with the scheduling, they just didn't think they were going to be able to do it. So that's where Mr. Tyre, you know, was at, so. Okay. It's intended to come back in October, so it's not going to take that long. And yeah. I think that the meeting, we had already proposed the rerouting, and that, I got apologies in my email, so, you know, from people who have been complaining before. So I think a lot of, a lot of the complaints have gone away. Um, but there's more work to be done, and we're still working on negotiating with, uh, we have a potential new opening out in that neighborhood, and if we get around that, that would solve many of the problems. So it's still in process, and also they'll, we will know the results of a grant up to 500000 by July, so that would be another factor that would help to pay for this. So October makes a lot of sense. That's the goal is to have in front of the town by October. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to, at the request of the Land Utilization Committee dated April 12, 2022 to remove Article 28 from the June 6, 2022 Spring Annual Town Meeting Warrant. Motion by Mr. Studo, a quiet second by Mr. Oh, I'll second it. Oh, I thought it was you. I didn't hear you properly. I second was second by Mr. Walter. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. So they're, they'll be back. So this isn't an article that's going away. It's sponsored by Land Utilization. They're going to go back to their work on this, and we'll, we'll see it again. Yep. So that anybody that's attending, the general public knows that it's just because it's not on this one doesn't mean it's going to come back. But I also think from what I heard during that meeting, they were going to roll out more public public meetings mm -hmm. about it yep. as well. I think Reed and Mullen had mentioned that they, that they wanted to get to go and working on, you know, getting more information out there on it, which will, I think will help. Yep, so it still appears on the land, you can still see the plan on the land utilization uh, page of the de uh, department thing, and Phil and I did a, um, a interview with Matt Ligor, he's our local interviewer person, we just did it this last week to help get the word out again. We did a 30 minute session just to keep getting the word out that we're working on this. So there's no uh, surprises. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Gilberto. I, I understand there was a grant application submitted at one point. Do I understand, is there a further application that Mr. Hertz is trying to submit? As well, well, I think we have talked about that letter that he's asking us to do. So there's a letter that he went to Danielle on to the town planner and then we just needed a, an official employee of the town to mm -hmm. help say that they would be the connect, they would be the, um, the point contact for the town mm -hmm. employees, if you will. And so that's what that letter is about. He, but, he's, yeah, but he's going for the up to five hundred thousand dollar grant. Is it an additional grant application? Because I understand. Yeah, I think it's the same it's one. The, the grant application. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I know they're looking for some sort of indication of town support or not. So is that something land utilization will consider? Or? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. All right, so we can- I, I know it has to be in by May 16th. Mm -hmm. I know that. But, okay, so, mm -hmm. so I have one question for that. Just, we're, we're getting more info. Define town support. Yeah. Because the LUC can't, I'm, they could agree that this is a good idea. They can't call that town support. And we can make that very clear to Mr. Todd. <coughs> Right, I mean, that's my, I, I you know, how I, I'm a little sensitive about that. About town support's real town support, not LUC support. And if that's before May 16th, there's not gonna be enough time to get, to gauge town support. Am I wrong in that? Yeah, yeah that's what that's asking for, town support. I think we have to, I mean, there has to be some official connection to the town, right? It doesn't mean that, I mean, you can apply for a grant and then never take it. So I think we need to have further conversation with, with Ms. Hurst about what they're asking for. That, that's all I'm saying. I, I know in the past applications have been submitted pretty um, under the radar, but obviously there's a lot of concern in the community and I just want to make sure we're not doing anything 
outside the lines. That's all. Mr. Gilbert, what do you mean by? I would assume any grant application has to have your, has to be, you have to know about it, or, or Ms. Rourke has to know about it. Because it has a financial impact on the town. So at times we've found out about the application once the award's been made. So this is an instance where I think the state DOT is trying to prevent that from being, being the case. So we have to figure that out. You're sure, I would say, I would say if, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody on the board, but I think that if, you know, j just as in general practice, <laughs> you shouldn't be surprised by a grant application. You should have some, no at least some, we're putting it in. I know you know about this one, but to me, town support would be a vote of the town. Mm -hmm. And right now we have it off of the warrant with the likelihood it's coming back. So. The most I think can be represented there is that it's likely to be addressed for a town vote at the, an upcoming annual town meeting. Sure. And I think that in that aspect might, it's not necessarily, it's going to go through the motions. Mm -hmm. And I think Mr. O'Leary explained that to the attendees at our last meeting. It goes through the motions if land utilization asks for it to go back on the, on the warrant but it's not really fully done until the vote happens. Yes, yeah, so I, I think we need to figure out exactly what we're representing. And right now the town support, to the extent it's out there, was for a feasibility study in 2018. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had town support already at prior meetings right. to move it forward, at least in those chunks of it. Yes. So that history I'm, it could certainly be put in a letter, but I don't know if there's any other, my colleagues have any other thought on that. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the town meeting already approved for $50,000 $50, to move forward on this and take it to a certain point because now state money is available. Uh, I think that would help the town meeting in October to make a well informed decision. And so I think buying an application for grant <coughs> is a good idea. I think that would again assist the uh, town meeting in making an informed decision as to whether or not they want to move forward. Now. To Mr. Walden's point, we may the award of the grant, I don't think anyone has an issue with that. It's the question of getting a letter from Mr. Gilberto saying the town supports the project because we don't have that yet without a town vote on the full no, project. Other, other, no, other than we've, we've already we're, we're, yeah, appropriated right, $50,000 right. to put the feasibility for the next stage. Yeah. So that would be nice to have. Yeah. For consideration. I don't, I don't think it's a far stretch to... Well, it's also, it would also only be used for the 25% plan. So the feasibility within the 25% plan, that's what it would be used for. So, and they, the oh, state the next knows, phase of it, in the way. next phase. So it, 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 the state knows that you might at the very end reject it all. So they know that. So it's really just to go to that 25% to help pay that $850,000. Yeah. That's what those are used for. Okay. So I think that puts more weight on decisions we've already made to pursue it, but we're already in that standard. My only okay. question is, what is, Mr. again, Mr. the definition of town support? If the TA writes a letter saying the town supports that, that's going to read that the town supports that, and people are going to light their hair on fire. Yeah, that's a fact, though. Like, that's like I say that I think that, yeah, that I think it's a good idea that we, you know, that we need grants for sewer, but he just, before we even vote on it, writes a letter to the state saying the town already supports it. We, I, we, we can't do that. Am I, am I missing something? The town supported it. The town supported it as far as the feasibility and awarding the money. So that would be, to me, support to go forward to the next phase. It's not saying, we're, we're ready to go like everybody wants it, it, it I don't think it's asking that so it's, we, we have to it's asking determine. to this point is there support but he keeps saying we have to determine it everybody's just missing what mr. Goberto say I'm not dismissing what mr. Goberto not dismissing missing I, that's or mi why I'm saying it should not be I, I, a surprise I, I, 
Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would say the board should allow Mr. Gilberto to leave it up to yeah. him, himself after he yeah, discerns what's going on here, what the nature of the letter should be. Understanding, we've heard from several members of the town right now, and, and you know those items need to be addressed. But. I don't know if that's a consensus here. So, Mr. Gilberto, so add, add your comment, please. Madam Chair, as you can imagine, you know we see grant applications pretty regularly and often in between board meetings. So we're very careful about the representations that we make, and they usually refer to prior approval, for example, of a portion of a project, or intending to request funding at a future point in time. Um, generally, a blanket statement of support doesn't often occur. The wastewater project, I feel like I can take a little bit more liberty because of the select board's discussions on that project and because we have a substantial investment that we made in October of last year. And we um, had a town that approved that agreement yes. with, with Andover. Correct, yes. And that agreement yeah. contemplated that entire piece of moving us forward on that. So we have an approved agreement there. We do. And you know, for, the, for this project, we have a feasibility study that we've conducted um, that was matched with funding from uh, from the state as well, which was uh, certainly, you know, I think, um, an indicator of the state's support. Um, you know, my comments or whatever I can provide through the process are going to be limited, obviously, because of how far along this project has gone. And, and a blanket, the town support this supports this project is not something I'm comfortable signing off on at this point in time, especially based on the feedback that we've heard from the residents. That said, I, I can't speak to what has been approved. And, and the designation of a staff person, which will probably be somebody here in the town hall, which they're also requesting, and that's that's easy enough for us to, to do. But uh, I, I just want to be clear with folks: I'm not intending to sign a letter that gives a blanket. The town supports this project because I just there are there are limits to that support. Right now. So, but I think we all know that. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Okay. All right. Are we all set with that. So if you're running a hurdle before it makes us too say something, it's a half a million dollars. <laughs> Line. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And a lot of effort that's already gone into this planning for, for now several years. But mm -hmm. it is Mr. Studo's point is well made and Mr. Gilberto's apprehension is understandable. So we could, we could leave it up to Mr. Gilberto if that's the board's. I'd like to see what they're asking for further. Yes. I, I just don't have that detail yet. I have some detail for Mr. Hurst, but not all of it. It really just highlights that the, we need a grant writer here that can mm -hmm. just summarize these things for the TA. <coughs> the TA isn't reading through these pages and pages and pages of things. It's great that our committees and boards and different individuals are going, going for this money, and we want that. We want that effort to be made. It surely would help us to have a grant writer that's qualified and confident to be able to shepherd us through a lot of these details. All right, so we're gonna we're moving on to, and that was a withdrawn warrant. Right? <laughs> Let's move on to the ones that are still there. <laughs> All right, Mr. Gilberto, do take we it want away. Motion, then, do we do we vote on the motion? Yeah. We did. We did. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Second. Yep. Uh, I think we're on to uh, the article relative to a forestry consultant at the request of the forestry committee, yes. for which there's a representation here um, this evening. Welcome. Well, briefly introduce, so Dana Rowe, as we all know Dana Rowe, was on the Swan Pond area, and we have Allison Polito, who is a very recent uh, joiner of our committee. We're only a committee of three, plus myself, so it's a very small committee. Uh, the forest committee in the past has always focused on maintaining the forest itself, um, but the economics of doing that has not been so good. So we looked at the, uh, the plan that Allison's gonna talk to you about, and we're expanding in other areas. So, and we should say for Allison Polito, who's new here, um, she just defended her dissertation last week, so we now have to call her a doctor. Oh, oh congratulations. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we welcome you. We have the whole committee, so this is, seems like a joy. Pretty much that. Welcome. welcome. Thank you for volunteering for this committee, and take it away. Um, are you going to put the slideshow? Oh, yeah. She has a few slides. Can we just look at them? And just, you're, just, 
You stay right there, you're okay. I was gonna say, Ms. Polito, we can't really hear you, so. Oh, I'll speak louder. And, and for those joining us, I forgot right. to announce. Do you want me to speak? I can just speak if that's easier. Uh, how many slides did you have? Slides on iPhone. Four. If you want to, you want to email them to my email account, which I think you have, I can I get know. them for you. I did skip over the announcement that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM. <laughs> we're also, because we're, uh, you know, participating remotely, we're also recording it for the town via <laughs> Zoom. Some other people might be broadcasting it. We're not, we're not sure about, but that's supposed to be something I say at the outside. So. Well, while you're looking, Mr. Walner, I think he'd give us the genesis of this warrant article. I think we talked about it before, right? Oh, yeah, but you can just talk right on this. I mean, you can just talk verbally if you don't have any slides. Maybe, I think, yeah, maybe, that might be quicker. Maybe. Yeah, sorry. Do you want a um, copy of my slides to look at? Oh, so, no, I have it on my phone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I was just trying to find your email and my email. Anyway. Um, so the Swan Pond Forest area um, is currently a very underutilized space in our town. Um, it was noted as an area of interest uh, on the Open Space Recreation Plan of 2020, um, and there was some public support noted for improving the area. Um, and the fact that it's underutilized does cause some issues there currently. Um, there are issues with people dumping their trash there, uh, there's issues with unauthorized motorized vehicles like ATVs that are kind of tearing up the land. Um, issues uh, with parking, there's not really great parking area for people that want to use it. Um, and there's not great fire or safety access and people do go in there and you can see, um, you know, bottles and paraphernalia that looks like people might be lighting fires. So um, that's a big issue as well. Uh, so we are looking um, to, A, increase awareness and public use of this land, um, in, especially in a controlled manner. Um, and in order to do that, we do believe it's best to hire a professional consultant um, to assess and kind of design these improvements and, and show us where it can best be improved. Um, basically, we've realized that we need some expertise in this area, um, partly for assessing the land boundaries. The, Swan Pond Forest area is owned by three different groups, um, partly the school committee, partly the conservation committee, um, and part uh, just general town uh, government. Um, so we need to be able to assess where the boundaries of the Swan Pond Forest area are and each of the stakeholders where their boundaries are, as well as um, private property of others. Um, we are also looking for professional design of trail improvements. So there is a trail system there that we need to assess um, but we're hoping to improve upon that as well. Uh, in particular, we're hoping to make some of the trails more accessible, um, like hand handicap or people with disabilities. Um, and we're also hoping that by having formal conceptual plans, uh, that this will make it easier for work to be done, partly by the forest committee ourselves, partly by volunteers. We have gotten a ton of interest from like scouting groups, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and also from other organizations like um, uh, Dana reached out to Essex Agricultural School, um, and they have some interest in doing work as well, but we need these formal plans first. Um, and also for grant funding, if we wanted to do grant funding to have some of this work done, we would also need these plans in place already. Um, so for this, we are requesting funding up to $65,000 for the purposes of hiring a consultant to assess the current trail system and uh, in the Swamp Pond Forest area and provide conceptual design plans for trail improvements. And this was based off of a proposal that we did get that we would hope to make an RFP out of um, and put out for bids. Uh, any questions? <laughs> questions. <coughs> Mrs. Gonzalez. So I was on that committee with the open space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure the purpose of that was so that we could go ahead and apply for grants mm -hmm. for things like this. Mm -hmm. So would that qualify, would this qualify for a grant? 
So we have looked into grant funding options. Um, we reached out to like the Salomon Foundation and um, Mass Department of Transportation. We haven't yet found grants that would apply particularly to this. Um, we are, of course, going to keep looking, um, but we haven't found any currently for like the design portion of this. Yeah. Um, they tend to require plans already. Have we reached out to the person, I forget her name, was um, from the state who kind of conducted that whole thing? We, uh, we have talked to the state, but it seems like they want uh, more of this conceptual plan. Already in so place. Kind of like, so in other words, they say, what do you really want to do? Yeah. You know, and we can't tell them yet because we're not really true. Okay, sure, I see. so they good. want that phase, this phase one, and then the they'll consider. Yes. Okay. Uh, and right. then I, I think from there, it will be much easier to get grant funding okay. for the actual work of the improvements. All right. This Thank you. Yeah, it would be great, because that, that was a spot that we... This is done. actually uh, the forestry program we had, we had. It was a three-phase uh, program. We did phase one and two, and phase three we held off because we had some... Uh, questions uh, by some uh, the people in town as to you know what we were doing why and how and yeah. wanted a lot of information in the interim the market for, for uh, forestry products dropped so the forester recommended that we not uh, do the third phase which would have been a cutting program uh, but part of that forestry program also is to utilize trails you know set up trails better access for uh, firefighting, things mm -hmm. like that. So this is a continuation of that program, which right now, uh, that has stopped. We have to reapply to the state to because it's lapsed, because okay. of such a period of time. And right now, the economy being as such, as far as a cutting program, uh, right now the forest doesn't recommend it. Mm -hmm. So this is still part of that program. It's continuing on. Yeah, thank you. So we found when Ms. we were trying Ms. to. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Ms. Gonzalez, you're all set. I am. Thank you. Mr. Walner. Uh, when we were trying to find consultants, it became very hard to find any consultants at all. We explored a few avenues of where we thought it was promising, and then we thought, oh, there really isn't anything there. So what she's saying is until you really put up what your plan is, you're not going to really get anything. Once you get beyond that point, I think the world's yours, but uh, yeah. not up until then. Okay. Any other questions? No, I'd just like to go on record this, in support of this whole idea. I mean, we have a lot of uh, open space in North Reading that is underutilized. Yeah. And I think this is a tremendous initiative that's being undertaken by the forestry community, particularly up in this region, that we have a lot of open space. And there, are, there is a trail system in there, but it's not heavily utilized. Or, and maybe create some access for parking so people can take advantage of it because it's a beautiful area and it's a, a resource that needs to be opened up to the public. And if we have to invest some money here to uh, make it so grants available to us, or even down the road if we want to invest our own taxpayer money to, to build it out, at least we'll have a plan. Right. Think, uh, we need the plan in order to apply for the grants. We need the plan to look at you know, what the feasibility of it is I just think it's a good idea. Yeah. I know you're not going to be cutting down the trees right away. Yes. Well, we did. We had I know you did. Cutting yeah. programs and the yeah. other people who wanted to firewood and stuff. So. Okay, Mr. O'Leary, all set? All set. All right, here's my comments. First of all, I wanted to ask what you meant by a cutting program, because I wouldn't be in favor of I Actually, <coughs> I've lived here for about 20 years and have never been to that area until about three weeks ago, dropping my son's friend off. And I was just, it's beautiful. I had no idea it was there and what it was. It's just gorgeous. And I think, I think if it was something, it doesn't seem like it's, it seems very private, very, very private. So from what we know from the recreational rail trail, one of the major things that should be done now is some outreach to all of the homeowners 
which I saw several as I was, one side's all forest, the other side's all homes. And there's probably more homes in there because I didn't go all the way through it. But you, you need to let all of those homeowners know what's going on with your work. Don't assume that they know it because you're there. That's number one. Bring, and bringing them on board with it so that they are not concerned about the impact that it would have on their process. Because I would be concerned about that if I bought in that area thinking this is private and it's not really accessible, even though it's public land. And when you say there's three stakeholders, they're all town. So it's all town owned, even though it's public land based on those three st stakeholders still would probably have a pretty significant impact on those residents. So bringing them into it, I think, is really key here to letting them know, here's what we're doing and why. So that is part of our proposed project. Like in the proposal, um, one of the very first steps is a meeting with all the relevant stakeholders, um, including uh, the committees that own the property, as well as the private property abutters. Um, and one thing just to make clear with this project, it would just be to assess and provide design plans. Um, it would not be to alter or do any work at this time. Um, it's just really information gathering. So a really important piece of that is just getting all the names from the assessor of those people that have bought that beautiful, beautiful forest. Uh, when we did the forestry program, all the abutters were notified. You have to do that on the state law. It's a, it's a state approved program. Uh, you send it to the state, they approve it, then it comes back to the town, and the town's approval. This was all done when they did the forestry program. So that the, and the three entities voted on it separately the select for the conservation and the school committee. So they were all appraised of it before it happened. And then, like they said, it's actually, when we did the cutting programs, it was posted all around the boundaries. And I believe, I'm not positive, but I think it was, I think it was a 40 foot buffer that we kept between the boundaries as we knew them. Uh, and this is one of the things that this program would do, was go in and we would have definitive boundaries so we could go to this corner is the corner of the school land, and this is private land, so and so forth. So all that stuff would be part of this program. But everybody has up there, when they did the cutting programs, it was posted, it was in the paper, and everybody was notified. So what we know about the recreational rail trail is that isn't enough. And that it isn't enough to post it. People don't read the paper. So what you're doing are, pieces of a larger outreach effort that needs to be done here. And I do think having some, calling for some public meetings, inviting the people in the area that are going to be most affected is going to be a real key. And recognizing that that has to be on a rolling basis, not just a one-time basis. Well, we sent a letter, because that's what we heard. And all the direct abutters for the rail trail, some of whom have lived there for a long time, really said that they weren't contacted. So we really need to have some, you know, some notification process where there's a confirmation that that, that homeowner, really it's the homeowners, were, were notified. Not just the, the boards, but the homeowners. Not the boards that vote on it, but the people that are, it's going to impact the most and inviting them to kind of participate in your public process about what you're doing and why, even if it's just rolling out an explanation to them. I think it's a real important thing because people read Facebook. They don't read the paper. That's just the fact of the matter. They read whatever someone else is posting on Facebook. And it could be right, it could be wrong, but the more that we can do to kind of manage that on an ongoing basis, because the other thing about this rail trail that we know is Cha owners changed hands. So someone you might have notified three years ago or six years ago, that's outdated now. And the new person has no idea about it. You know? So any of that outreach that can be coordinated on a rolling basis, not just one notice, maybe once every few months, here's an update. I know that's a cost of 
that's going to be costly and there's a way that might you might be able to do it by if you want more information give us your email so we can give you an email blast you know when we're ready to take the next step or would we or just give you an update every few months I think that's a real key to just opening that ch channel of communication and and I do applaud <coughs> your efforts on it but my other thing is tell me what's the cutting program what is that well, the cutting, originally the cutting program that we had was we actually had uh, companies come in. Uh, every tree was marked that was available to be cut. Uh, every single tree, you put two marks on you put one at uh, uh, DBH, the, uh, the diameter breast height. You put a mark there and then you put a mark right down on the stump. So that when that tree is cut, you know that if there's not a mark on the stump, they cut the tree that they shouldn't have cut. <coughs> Professional foresters come in and mark every single tree. Then uh, companies come in and they bid on how much they will pay to come in and do the cutting. That was all done. Uh, there was two cuttings that were done. Uh, they were all marked. They were all the people were notified. Posters were put up. It was in the newspaper. And probably was going before Facebook and the rest of it <laughs> when we did it. But we also had public cutting programs where the residents of North Valley would go up there and cut firewood. And we had that. That was pretty successful for a number of years. And uh, the last few years, it's, it's died off. We really had only had actually two or three people have come to the committee individually and asked to go up there to cut dead wood and stuff, which we have worked with before, so we will allow it. Uh, there's a good possibility that in the next year or two we might try to do that again. Uh, and people, what people did was they came in, town hall, they filled out a request, and we had it on Saturdays and Sundays. We had people up there, and they would come up and cut their own firewood and take it out. So. But you're not talking about healthy trees, are you? Uh, it, well, the, the professional forestry, yes, we took a lot of that. that that's been cut over quite extensively because it was it was really required for good civil culture practices. You want to take out a lot of trees that were overgrown, other trees they call wolf trees, to allow new growth to come up. Uh, also, we've had a citizen that's up there that he's planted probably a couple hundred uh, chestnut, American chestnut trees, which are new type that are supposedly disease resistant. So we've had, like I say, it's probably at least a couple hundred trees replanted up there. But there is a section up there that really should be cut. It hasn't been cut for years and it's overgrown and it's not it's not good growth. I just want to be clear though that that's not the project we're currently no. working on. <laughs> no, that's the last project that we oh, may revisit in the yes. future. No, and that's we'll okay. come back for that. <laughs> But that is not what this proposal is. Kate loves her trees. Just a guy, you know, <laughs> killing me with the cut. Yeah, I know. Right, we, this is truly just information gathering. Okay, what yes. What do we have yes. as, far, no. as far as the trail system? What do we have as far as boundaries? Um, and where can we possibly mm -hmm. just from a design perspective? Yeah, but no, I, it's, it's great to hear about this, too, sure. because it was before really anything that's that since I've been on the board, it hasn't been that long. So this is all stuff that's been worked on for years and years and years. So it, it's great to hear about these programs that exist or maybe can be modified over time to some degree, you know? We might, we might be back in a few years <laughs> to talk yeah. more about that. All right, uh, thank you. Um, okay, just, it's important to note that, that uh, Dana Rowe has been a long time owner in uh, year-round resident now up in Swan Pond area, lifelong resident here, former member of this board, uh, captain of the fire department, and committed preservationist up, up in that area. Amen he to that. He also, he also did develop it, put a fine development yes. up there, yeah, uh, being beautiful. truly cognizant of, of the surroundings of the environment. Mm -hmm. So Data's been involved with this for 100 years, and uh, nobody's more conscious of it and uh, conscientious in relation to the necessary cutting in order to keep the forest healthy. And uh, the program that they had in place a few years back was uh, was essential in order to, to achieve that. So they've done a great job in the past. I'm glad to see it's getting new life and uh, I think it's 
So that's something we should ensure sure address. But uh, yeah. I want to applaud his efforts over the years and his continued support. I think it's important. That's but great. again, he knows the neighbors, he knows the neighborhood. Yes. And uh, yeah. I'm sure the outreach will be there. I think that's really important to, to make sure that's on a rolling basis. Just because we saw what happened with the rail trail, where it was something that went first stage, approved town meeting, next stage, and, and then all of a sudden this stage, maybe there was a lot of turnover, maybe there were a lot of people that <coughs> a notice may or may not have been mailed to that got picked up or lost or something, or, but we heard from a lot of the residents, they didn't get those, so, and they're not looking at the paper. So that's why I think any of that outreach that go, goes on, I think would be fantastic and helpful. Yes. So whatever program you decide to implement, it's helpful. Any other questions? We're good? All right. Well, thank you so much for thank you. your time. Appreciate your coming forward with this. Do you need a vote on each of these? As we, okay, you Not just yet. want Next us thing. to review tonight. All yep. right. Well, did you want to tell us what your dissertation was about? <laughs> <laughs> um, Get to know your North Reading neighbors. Um, I, so my PhD is in nursing, and I did a study on delirium among patients with limited English Oh, wow. It's like really specific. Wow, <laughs> very specific. Yeah. Uh, I've been an ICU nurse for about 15 years, and it's something I see a lot of, so it's a, a passion project. Wow. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. What a study delirium. We're Come back. <laughs> yeah. Especially after 10. Oh, yeah, when it's a late meeting, there's lots of delirium. Oh, no. I was about four years old. Four years old. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Okay. <laughs> all right. The next is the oh, welcome. The uh, the one that's near and dear to the select board's heart. The next two, really. I'm here for two. In no chief, I'm not letting you know you're coming. <laughs> Increase the account amount, excuse me, the increase the amount for disabled veterans property tax exemption, increase the income limit for elderly property tax deferral. Welcome. Thank you. How is everyone tonight? Good, thank you. Wonderful. So what we're looking at doing is under clause twenty two, that is the veterans exemption, the veterans would go to the VA and they have what's called an award letter if they've received 10% or greater disability. Since 1986, we have awarded them $400. So back two years ago, this state allowed by local adoption that the towns can go up to 800 so we could double it or add to it. So that's what we're here in front of, what I'm here in front of you for tonight, is to see if the, if we want to bring this to a warrant article in front of the town's people to increase. Now, there, there are a few things that we need to think about. The increase amount is not reimbursed by the state. Currently, we file what's called an MDM one, it comes back on our cherry sheet, and that's reimbursable money for the first 400. Anything that we add to that 400 is not going to be reimbursable. It will be coming out of our overlay account. Our overlay account, just in case you don't or um, not sure of, that's the money that we put aside and raise on the recap for any abatements and exemptions. So that's what we're looking at to, to determine, you know, should we go to 600, should we go right to the 800, and how do we want to address this? How many households right now receive the, the $400 exemption? So, so that we would have an idea of what it would what would come out of the overlay for the remaining So balance. for fiscal 22, we had 59 applicants that qualified. 
that would be 21,200, 20, 20, hold on one second, I wrote it, 21,200 that we would be in, that we would be on the hook for, if you will. Do you anticipate an increase in the number of individuals who might seek this uh, exemption in the coming year or fiscal year or next excuse me tax quarter so for fiscal 23 do i anticipate more applicants yes how many we had 43 in 21 and we have 59 okay but we have to understand two things and one of them is they do have to have that award letter from the VA saying that they have been determined 10% or greater disability. Just serving in the service does not qualify for this exemption. Now, with that being said, too, we're still in a war. So do I anticipate more new applicants? Yes. Could I put a number on that? I, I honestly, I couldn't. I can tell you we average maybe five, six, seven okay. increase a year. So what would cost the town is about 23,600. Say 22. I didn't do, I did that on my calculator, not in my head. So yeah, questions, quite <laughs> questions of the committee, colleagues, my colleagues. Mr. Or oh, comments, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, this hasn't been this hasn't been updated in, in years. The legislature just came through, which allows the local communities to do it. I think we should uh, do that. But I think we should also encourage our legislators to up the reimbursements through Cornwall, since their coffers are very full these days too. As far as reimbursements to the communities, but I think we should do it anyway. It's additional, you know, less than twenty-four thousand dollars for the current eligible uh, veterans. I think it's fine. I think it's time to yeah. move it on up along with the, the next one that's going to be proposed. Qu Questions? Mr. Walner? I'll just say people are in disability. They don't get a lot of income, so I think it's a, it's a worthy thing to do to support them. Mr. Studo? I'm fine with the numbers. Ms. Gonzalez? We don't do enough for them, so yeah, All absolutely. Right, I agree. I, I, it isn't even the disability aspect. It's someone who's willing to go out there and right. serve to me that should get some measure of benefit and I am wholeheartedly in favor of this. So you want to explain the next one? We're all for it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming that because no one said hold on. Hold on, five hundred. <laughs> what? The money. The money. Why am I in, the money. No, I would say that. Wait, I, wait a I, minute. I'm for the whole I'd like amount. To spend money. The, no, the the. Uh, I didn't hear anyone say anything less than what the full Did value, unless any? Mr. Gilberto's just <laughs> have any comment on that. I think a letter from under the chair signature to our legislative delegation encouraging yes. us to adopt the reimbursement yes. to the community for some additional level is warranted yeah. also. Yeah. Yes. Which I can reach out to them and see. Are we all in agreement with that? I'm good. Yes. All right. All right. So the next one is called the Clause 41A. The 41A was created for seniors that have gotten up in age and their income stays very stable with just their reliability on Social Security. And again, um, the town in North Reading, I can tell you the last applicant we had was in 2009. It was paid off in 2010. Now, how a 41A works is the applicant can defer their taxes up to the 50 percent that they can defer their whole taxes they can never defer over 50 percent of their valuation so let me explain that 
after five years, ten years, whatever their valuation is, the town can never, once it got to that ten year mark, if we were at 50% of their valuation, then we have to have them pay that off. So there, there are thresholds in that. We have not had another applicant come in. We did have two come in and inquire this year. One took an application and never returned it. The biggest part with the 41A that this town would struggle with even accepting an application is the income levels are at $20,000. It, that's that's yes. crazy, and I know Steve and I have had conversation on this. So we have been granted the authority to increase, and again by local adoption, we have we can increase the income limits that follow the circuit breaker guidelines. So the guidelines for the circuit breaker for fiscal 22 was 62,000 for a single, 78,000 for a single head of household, and 93,000 for married filing jointly. So they would have to file the circuit breaker in order to have this 41A, but that that's that's a bonus for them because then they'd still receive the 1170 that was given for the circuit breaker filing last year. And that goes up by the whole. So that's what we're looking at, you know, it just increasing our limits. If there is a senior out there that would or wanted to apply for this, at least at that point, having these higher guidelines with the income limits increased, we can accept their application and <coughs> give them that option. They don't have to defer all of their taxes. They can defer 10%, 50%, whatever. So it doesn't eliminate the taxes. It only allows them It defers to. them. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is in this proposed Warren article, it says that set at to the rate set, so the rates you the, the limits you just explained are current, so the commissioner of revenue can shift those higher next year, for example. Once we say yes to this, whatever it tracks to what the commissioner decides are annually set, and how often do those get increased? So, for the circuit breaker income levels, those are set annually. And they usually go by the COLA. So oh. that's that's going to change annually. We would have to take this vote every year oh. because we're basing it on yet another, another piece of evidence from the state being the circuit breaker. So we would have to take this vote every but year. That's the, not a big deal. That's the, the tax classification here. Along with all the other we can, exactly, it can be done in that right. very same. Yeah. That's a great idea, Steve. Oh. Okay. All right. Any, Mr. Studo? Um, so if it's deferred, it's due to like sale of a property or something. There's like a lien on the t that the town puts. Is that how it works? Exactly. There would be a lien, and there is interest charged also. And okay. is it one of those where, you know, how like a closing attorney will clear the title? to make sure before it goes so it would have to pre like the close it would have to be get cleared at closing not we have through, to go chasing after it would have to get cleared through what's called the mlc process which is a municipal lien certificate and that goes right through our treasurer so our treasurer <coughs> would know and we always you know have conversation on what's coming up or not um, and then the 8% interest. I can tell you just, you know, for past information and past knowledge, when anytime we've had deferrals, it's usually paid off when the homeowner is either one passed away or two sold the property. That, that's your two main reasons that it ends up passing, you know, getting paid off. 
and it usually has maybe a five to eight year life on on the deferral. I mean, and we can we've been able to float it. Like is, any, like is there an analysis where if you move it up to 93, which is, you know, it's about 75% of median income for North Reading, um, how many more people would, I'm not saying they all take it because eight steep. And also the, the interest rate, how, how is that set? The interest rate is set by the state right now. That is another thing and that wouldn't have to come from the treasurer's office if you, if the town wanted to reduce that interest rate. Okay. That doesn't come from my office, that comes from the treasurer. Do you think you'd anticipate like a lot? And again, it's just, if it's a matter of getting the money with interest at some point, it's like a no harm, no foul, but I mean, at 93,000, right, a lot more would qualify, correct? Yes. So does, that, does that hurt us if all of a sudden we had, I don't know, couple million dollars of deferrals so that that's my that that's my concern because we have a lot of stuff we want to fund and we're gonna we can't we can't just have two million float right so that's just if, if I could just add a little to that I mean, having conversations with our seniors at the counter when they've come in and we do take the time and we talk to them and they're very open about it a lot of them are just trying to see if they can get a little tax relief. They're not really looking at deferring their taxes in whole. It's the increase that mm -hmm. continues. So, in that being said, do I anticipate a flood of deferrals coming through? In all honesty, I would sit here and say, no, I don't anticipate a flood. I don't. But can I guarantee that? Of course not. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see it. Just in talking to our taxpayers here, it's not there. I don't see a flood of them and, coming to our county. And is it specific to property taxes? Yes. Like no special levies or if there was like a vote for something else where people have to pay for certain projects like like a school or something like can they defer those taxes as that it's property tax property so yes a uh, school which would be yes okay. school is property tax but for betterment storage no Chip, yeah. just, Mr. Just, Mr. Mr. Studer, will you all say yeah, just in relation to the circuit breaker, I mean, there's certain eligibility <coughs> requirements in relation to, and the relationship is income driven, 62 to 93,000 uh, married couples, and the relationship of their real estate tax bills. So it has to be like 10% of their income before they get eligible for the circuit breaker. So that's going to limit, it doesn't, I mean, I do a lot of taxes. Mm -hmm. so, people that do a lot of circuit breaker uh, tax returns. Uh, for people that, again, generally it's people who are uh, little, you have to be 65 years of age in order to qualify, first of all. But most people that are qualifying for the circuit breaker are much older. Uh, the, the, their incomes have been fixed for a substantial amount of time. The Social Security is primary source of income. Pensions are pretty much fixed or whatever their investment income is. So that even people, I think the average, tax bill here is about $8,600, dollars You know, so the, the ratio is almost there. But there are a number of people who just don't meet that threshold. They might have meet the 93000 but their taxes are $6,800. They don't get the circuit breaker. They would be eligible this particular time. What most people are looking for, as, as she pointed out, is just a break on, on the increases. They're not going to defer the entire amount unless there's some extraordinary circumstances going on here. Uh, but just to to enhance their cash flow so they can age in place a little bit more easily uh, on their monthly costs. You know? So I, I don't see people coming in and looking for a, an all out exemption of their entire $9,000 a year in their taxes. You know, they're not going to come in and say, OK, I want to forego to $5,000, $4,000 just to enhance their cash flow on a monthly basis so they can age in place a little bit more, more easily. So I, I, I agree. I don't think you're going to see, you'll see an increase in activity. Because the last one we had was 2009, so it wouldn't take much to have increased activity. 
but you're going to see an increase in interest and activity depending on certain circumstances for certain periods of time. They don't have to do it every year. You, know, don't, you, you can come in looking for, for a break. And and just, just deferring it. And from a, uh, an interest rate standpoint, the, the rates that the state has established right now are near usury rates. You know, they're, they're not, that would discourage people from doing it. You know, an 8% rate, annual rate on the borrowing is high. You know, and so people really need to be in a position where they feel from a cash flow standpoint, this works for them, but then and when they go and sell the home or when they expire, move out. You know, mm -hmm. it works. You know, and the town isn't losing anything other than a little bit of cash flow, but that starts to become recurring income after a short, mm -hmm. short period of time. Can I ask a follow-up question? Oh, of course. Just Mr. O'Leary, you all set? Yep, Mr. Uh, Studo. Do we, would we be under any obligation to, let's say we set it right now and just use 93, and next year the circuit breaker goes to 98, 95. Do, 95, do we have to? At that point, do we have to stay pegged to the, whatever the circuit breaker? It is tied to the circuit breaker. Okay, so it is. It is tied to the circuit breaker. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Walden. So how are we getting away with that now? Because we're at twenty thousand. I was participating. I mean, I mean, we're at twenty thousand now, so we're not paid. So how? Do we because we haven't brought this to town meeting to tie it to the circuit breaker. We have only adopted clause forty-one A as a as itself, as the statute was written. What we're going to be doing in June is bringing it to the town for a local adoption to tie the income limits to the circuit breaker amounts. So it's it's just a. So are you saying if someone applied now because it said twenty thousand, they wouldn't be able to get it? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm if, if someone, if someone has they'd have to qualify. Like living life, they're not living in town. No, I, I understand right, that. Yeah. But I'm just trying to, I'm trying to forget. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Did now they the, 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 they're, they're only a lot eligible to apply if their income, their mm -hmm. gross receipts are a maximum no, of 20000 No, I understand that, so. but I'm just confused by the, 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 the... But we have never been pegged to the circuit breaker. Is what it right. Like. So it's a different. Right. It's a different provision that we would be putting on the warrant for the town to accept to tie it to that versus what we have, which is a different portion of the statute that limits it to income or gross receipts of twenty thousand. The other thing is that the, the circuit breaker eligibility is determined by the filing of the state income tax returns, which is verifiable for our staff to say, okay, show me a circuit breaker. Show me that you got the got the break. You're now eligible because the eligibility is determined by the criteria set by the state and the income limits. Whereas if we set it at fifty thousand or even twenty thousand now, we have to go through the machinations of analyzing their finances. Oh, okay. Now, you just answered my question. Okay, that and, is and that's analyzing their finances <laughs> before right. we determine they're eligible. Now I understand. That's but that if, forty-five but if you page the, thing. If you get the circuit breaker that they were it's deemed eligible. It's that. I got okay. I got it. Now I understand because I now I understand the difference why we yeah. would do this. Because I would assume too that people are only doing this more as a hardship than yeah. anything yeah. else because yeah, no where you're tacking on that interest, yeah. they might just be doing it till they get a refund on their return so they can use that to pay off whatever. Yeah. I don't know. So I don't know. You would know better than than the rest of yeah. us. The yeah. types of requests that you see or probably true. get a little insight on why they're being made. But so so I, 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 I've seen the application. It's very, you know, there's, there's just to see the application, it's very uh, intimidating. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to do it every year if you didn't have to. So I think it's great that it be tied to the circuit purpose. So that sounds good, because that's already <coughs> being done. Uh, this small little, and I know about this because we're on the tax aid committee, so I understand this pretty well. Um, so I'm in favor of it. Uh, just one question. Does it have to be referred to as elderly? Can refer to it as senior? As opposed to elderly of 65 or older, I don't think they're going to get The legal is, is title legal, under is statute is Clause 41A. And that's called elderly? It, senior dis, uh, senior exemption. Oh, well, on, the, the, senior Warren deferral. Articles, I'm on sorry. the Warren article, it says elderly. Elderly property. I'd like to change that to senior. Please. In the body of it, it says seniors, like it's let, written. Let me look at 
the statute I didn't bring that with me. Yes, sir. Well, maybe we, we'll, we will make sure the title reflects the statute. Please. 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 Thank you. Yeah, because age wise, I qualify. What's wrong with seniors? Well, there's no, nothing wrong with seniors. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it yeah, no, it says elderly. It's not interchangeable, yeah. elderly and senior? Oh, I see. Elderly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Elderly. People might be a little offended by that. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Especially if you're okay, no, no, 65. I, I, I'm, you're not going to want to be called elderly. elderly. No, there's elderly. Is <laughs> well, as of today, I think <laughs> I am too. <laughs> It's used a lot in official. Oh, everything. Right. It's really just a bad word. I'm just telling you All right. You Did some Mrs. Kinsa, are you all set, Mr. Wall? Yeah, it's just someone I'd else be interested in interested to correct that word. I was, yeah. I was, I was going to ask if we could just raise it without connecting to the circuit breaker. That was going to be my question, but Mr. O'Leary, explain that. Yeah. And no, and that work right well, we now could. it's. We could. It just yeah, but then you'd have to go no, the, through. The law says 20,000. A lot right. more work. They, well, they would have to go through a lot more work, yeah. The, the, the eligibility is determined by okay. an interested third party. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me, the application's intimidating right now. Yeah. Let me ask. No, so right now, it's set at 20 by operation of the statute that was accepted. Okay. But this is a different statute that allows it to be at the higher income limit because of its 41A. Section, no, chapter 59, section five, clause 41A. Right now we have a different clause that says up to 20,000 in gross receipts, right? No, our 41A is set to 20,000. We've never increased it. Oh, okay. We have not, we haven't had any since I've been Well, no wonder. We won't at 20,000. Yes. Oh so that was my question. Can we just increase it and not be part of the circuit? So to a set amount, break in other words. Right. But if that's going to make a huge amount of work for your office instead of is that that's what you were well, it, it's that. saying, right? That's the difference? Yes, plus, well, the determination of your eligibility is determined by your state tax file. Right. Period. Yeah. Period. That's all. Not an arbitrary number by the select board of North Reading? No. Right. But the state tax filing, <laughs> right. you're deemed eligible, you got the circuit breaker, you're eligible. You know? um, it just makes cleaner. it cleaner. It's cleaner. Yeah. It's easier. And again, as we're talking about, as we have in our strategic planning, and as we're talking, continue to talk about, how do we allow people to age in place here? And exactly. most of it has to do with, uh, we have a lot of people in this community that are land rich and cash poor. Yeah. And that's what the circuit breaker addresses. I'm one land of them. Land rich people are <laughs> cash poor, you know, and this provides an opportunity for them to defer some of their real estate taxes, not necessarily all of it, just some of it, to enhance their cash flow so they can stay in the home that they invested in, raised their children in, and invested in the community for a longer period of time. This is just another mechanism where we can grant them some assistance. And again, it's not for free. Right. Gonna pay, it's going to get paid back to the town of the taxpayers, and uh, it's a determination they have to make to you know, pay the interest rate on it. Okay. So they defer. <laughs> and everybody's we all have me, a lot of questions. Everybody's heard me say this too, especially during this whole, uh, you know, yeah, election really season. But it takes two empty nesters to send one of our kids to school. So we need we need empty nesters to send our kids to school because uh, it's six thousand dollars per household. It's fifteen thousand, sixteen thousand per kid. So you need two households plus the property tax from their own property in order to send our children to school. So we want to keep these young homes. Well, so that's, an, that's an argument against implementing this then. No, it's an argument for Because it's life. deferring that. Because if someone moves out, who moves in? Well, the, this is deferring Right now? That. More kids. It's, it's deferring it, but, it, but we want to keep once them you get through so that like initial it. deferral, yeah, get through the initial cycle, yeah. then every five or ten years, people who are selling their homes are then paying back into it. So yeah. again, you're going to have payoffs every year. It's just going to be a revolving account. People that will be deferring, people will be paying back as they sell. It doesn't happen all at once. It's second so Okay. Do you want so to stay in place? I do understand it, but I have a, oh, yes. <laughs> I, have I one would question. like to add uh, for what Steve's saying and the question whether we should just increase our amounts yeah. or should we tie it to the circuit right. breaker. By following this guideline with using the circuit breaker, they're also getting the deduction for 
the revenue from the state on the circuit breaker. Right? So why would we yeah. not, you know, encourage them to do that? And that's this year for 21, it was $1,170 that they were eligible for. And why wouldn't we do that? And the other thing, too, is any applicant that applies for the Clause 41A, if they do have a bank loan, even a reverse mortgage, they have to have that bank loan, uh, the bank sign off to the town before we can accept that application. And a lot of your banks will not do it. So, you know, what do you sometimes mean? we can struggle with that. So, say an applicant comes in and they have a reverse mortgage. Mm -hmm. We send them down to the bank. The bank has to submit a letter to the town, our office, stating that they are in full disclosure that there is this 41A that's being applied for and that they are okay with it or they disagree and will not honor is it. So is it, it like a taking first or second position type exactly, thing? That's exactly. Exactly. So you need the bank to. The, the town the actually bank has in front to, of the. No, no, the but the bank has to approve it. So that's well, a that's a well, big coup. Well, well, that's a big coup too. But you have to understand, people with a reverse mortgage again are using the equity in their home but yep. to stay in their home. Yeah. And there's certain guidelines and percentages of uh, assessed valuation or raised valuation. Thing. All government this backed. Is only, this is only up to 50 percent of the assessed valuation of their home. That maximize it. That would include, Max. and that would include mm -hmm. any outstanding mortgages. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah, so they have to the subordinate the so mortgage the whole to the idea town. Is not to put these people out on the street and, and bankrupt them. Same thing with the reverse mortgage products, which are much better than they used to be because before they were. Upon. Now they're all FHA. So now it's it's, it's much better than it used to. Uh, so again, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some hoops that the people have to jump through if they have a mortgage or they have a reverse mortgage. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the bank would have to sign off on it because again, their equity is being impacted okay. by the deferral of the taxes. And again, can only reach a certain <laughs> threshold of limit. So these people again, as they're taking the reverse mortgage funding, uh, are actually reducing. Yeah. They're deferring this additionally, and they have the wiggle room. Yeah. They're actually deferring <coughs> the timeline and amount of equity that they can actually draw on. Yeah. But that's okay. It's a financial decision but, that they have to make. It's but it's different than normal property taxes where if you don't pay your normal property tax, you can put a tax lien and it goes in, like, you know, without approval. And it goes in, yeah, yeah whatever it is, it's but years meaning. Until you get it. Huh? Yeah. Same thing. It's years until you get it, just like the deferral. It gets deferred <laughs> until it gets sold or okay. they get more closed on. The deferral is an, is an agreement on the lien, whereas foreclosure is not usually Friendly. both parties <laughs> willing to do this. No, <laughs> not So that's, that's the difference in, in that. It's an agreed deferral between yeah. both parties, the town <coughs> and the applicant. So in other words, their mortgage takes second place to the town's collection of its oh, outstanding tax and tax in tax yes. and in a tax taking if it does go into a sale they don't recuperate any of the equity that comes directly to the town anyway we so get paid first yes. get paid all for, right. for a tax yes. title foreclosure so are you all set? yep i'm all set thank you i have one more question for you on this if a senior avails him or herself of this um, tax deferral can they also do the 500 the exemption program they yes, can do both absolutely okay. so any of our applicants um, that are already receiving either a blind exemption or a senior exemption or a veterans exemption they're still entitled to those exemptions that comes off the top before we would start factoring in what amount they wanted to defer. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Gilbert, are you all set with this one? What's the majority of the, the
prerogative of the board. Mr. O'Leary in favor, Mr. Waller in favor, Mr. Sudo in favor, Mrs. Gonzalez in favor, Manny Pell is in favor. We haven't even asked Ms. Brock, and I'm not even going to look over there, so. <laughs> We'll figure it out later. We'll I, did, I did look. look. I looked. We're always going to get our money, and this is with that's interest. That's true, yeah. With 8%. I know. Actually, that's probably going up. 8 was based on a much lower. Uh, I think it's going to go Thank up. Thank you. Thank you. Not, the not to outdate myself, but I can recall 28 <laughs> years ago, the interest rate on deferrals back then was 16 percent. I think it goes to 10 by the time we vote on this next year. Good night. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Did I cut into your time? Well, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. That was very quick. Chief, I hope the alarm system is fast. Seems pretty self -explained. Because delusion has set in. Yeah. <laughs> for me. I don't know about anyone else. For her to come back and she continue that study. All right. All right. All right. Delusion or delirium, right? <laughs> so welcome, Chief. We're on to article, the proposed article uh, 25. Dissertation. Delusion, delirium, this part of our dissertation. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she should have hung around. Oh. So we are, uh, you're presenting a vote to amend the bylaw for fire, for, for fire alarm systems, right? Yeah, that's correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. So this is pretty straightforward, as you said, and it's just a change the bylaw and taking the fixed amount that's set in there for the master box connection fee, which is set at $300, and changing that to language that would just reflect that fee, not at a fixed amount, just being within the department fee schedule, which is allowed under chapter 40, section, excuse me, chapter 40, section 22F. Um, and that's where the rest of the department's fees and, and, um, are, are set within the fee schedule. And the impetus for this uh, change is, is basically to encourage people or businesses and um, master box connection, connected holders already to transition to the wireless system, which has a substantial cost to these people of about $7,000. Um, so in order to do that, I would like to offer some type of incentive to do that and maybe reduce that connection fee in order to encourage them to still stay connected to the master box system. Okay, questions? I don't understand what the master box, I can <laughs> use my imagination, but please be specific. Sure, no problem. So the master box is, uh, the, the, the red box is on the sides of the buildings, the fire alarm boxes, that's the master box. Okay. And that's connected to the wired system that we currently operate. And as you guys know, through the, the last two years of capital projects that have been approved, or hopefully have been approved, we're transitioning to a wireless system for Vernon City and, and, and uh, a better connection. And that results in a cost to those businesses or stakeholders that have a master box now to transition to a wireless box. Um, and like I said, that is approximately $7,000. So to help offset some of these businesses, I'd like to reduce some of those costs for them for a seven month time. With the bylaw, the way it's currently written, I can't do that. And it would also align this fee with the other department fees within the schedule. Okay. Second question. <clears throat> Second question, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, That's okay. I was yeah. expecting yeah. you to go um, ahead with and that. Is it, are they required to do it no matter what? I mean, are they required to go to the wireless? They're not required to. That's part of that's the second half of the battle that I try to encourage people to stay on the municipal system because it's much quicker. Um, they do have the option to go to a central station type of system like ADT or Black Lab or something that effect. Um, again, I feel that the system is much uh, more reliable as far as reporting to the station, and that's why I would urge them to stay on the system. Okay. And, and again, third question, what is the fee difference again? Because I got stuck at the master box. I didn't hear the... So right now, the three master three. box connection fee is $300, and I still have to look at how I would adjust that in the length of time I would adjust for these businesses that we would, that would consider purchasing and going on to the wireless system. But right now, that's impossible for me to do without this change. Is this $300 a year? $300, yes, $300 a year. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I, I'm sorry, but I do have a question. I confess I didn't look at Chapter 11 before this evening's meeting. Does that specifically re relate only to commercial parcels? No. That 
So this relates to all fire alarm all systems? Fire alarm. For or master boxes. For master boxes, Correct. which are typically <clears throat> on what type of properties? Any type of commercial occupancy or high hazard occupancy like Edgewood, Ulti, okay. some of the apartment buildings. But well, what if the, it doesn't seem to break down if the, I know you want to encourage that wireless connection, but what if a business or a commercial parcel um, isn't financially capable of upgrading? Are you going to keep the $300 fee for them to, that they get charged in for the servicing annually for their regular connection that currently exists? If they don't wish to transition. Right. Yes. It isn't clear here, though. It looks like you're <coughs> just going to define the fee as something other than that. So, so it doesn't specify in the warrant article, in other words, that this is a fee change for those um, par parcels that want to upgrade to a wireless connection. But it's the change isn't specific to just people that want to upgrade. All this is the change is doing is making the fee part of the department fee schedule. The reason why I'm trying to do that is because of the transition to the wireless system, but the change to the bylaw is just putting this fee, which is non specific as all the other ones are, within the department fee schedule. So we're actually removing it from the bylaw. <coughs> Correct. Removing, removing that $300 fixed amount from the bylaw and incorporating it into the uh, fee structure. So, yeah, but I think I think whenever we change fees around, it has to relate to the cost that we <coughs> incur to, you know, do whatever we need to do for whatever that annual fee is for review of it or inspection of it or well, not, not necessar maintenance. Not you know. necessarily. Like, I, I, I consider that there's a maximum amount that some of these fees are capped at by law. Um, I have not, and I looked at changing some of our different fees prior to COVID, and then once the pandemic hit, I didn't consider it because I didn't want to put an unnecessary burden on homeowners and businesses with, an, with a slight increase. So all this does is it removes that fixed $300 amount from the bylaw and allows the whatever fee I, the fire department charges to be within the department fee schedule. But how would a, someone know that when that's going to change? It looks like you're going to put your. So we, we send out bills annually. So if a, if a business was going to transition to wireless, <coughs> at that point I would have I would have already determined what that would look like, and I could offer what I could offer them to encourage them to stay on that wireless system. But that's all done within the department so. Does anyone have any? I guess I'm okay with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Get okay. On the walls. <laughs> Are we out? We're good. Are we all set? Anything so. else? No, well, that's it. That's pretty straightforward. Like I said, that's um, that was it. I just think the, a connection thing has to be related to what the cost is for what we incur for whatever work we're doing related to it. It can't be arbitrary. So that amount was, has been in existence for my entire career and it was set prior to obviously when I was hired. Um, what I'm trying to do is encourage people, like I said, to if they choose to purchase the wireless system, offer them a reduced amount of connection. I can't do anything right now because it's a set amount. So that is, in my opinion, trying to help businesses here in town and, and building owners to do that. Well, where does the seven thousand dollars come from? That's the cost uh, of the equipment 
that the contractor charges. So is the fee a percentage of that? Is how is the fee derived? The fee was to derived just based on probably on our expenditures at a certain point in time. And that three hundred dollar okay. connection fee has been set for many, many okay. years. We have not increased it either. So in other words, you want to be able to say, okay, we're gonna waive it if you go to wireless. For a certain amount of time. Exactly. Okay, all right. But then what's the fee gonna be? After after that set amount of time it would go back up to the three hundred dollars. Okay, all right. Correct. I think I Again, misunderstood that you know <coughs> some people were going to get charged seven thousand, some people going to get charged no. three. No, no. Right now, you're going to reduce the seven thousand. I seven. misunderstood. I'm sorry, but I didn't explain that well. No, enough. I'm the, sure you did. The but wireless equipment I is charged understand. by the contractor. That is, has nothing to do with us. Okay. All right. The connection to the municipal system is the only thing that we do. That's yes. The, that offsets some of the expenditures in maintaining the system. That's okay. Nice. All right. I see. I understand. That makes sense. Okay. Would, now it makes would, sense, Mr. O'Leary. I just step on. I apologize, but um, new people that tie in are they required to go wireless. They are required to either go wireless or electronic master box. Right now, all the new people we're pushing, we're urging them towards wireless right now. So, either wireless. What was the other? Uh, it's an electronic master box that we're trying to get away from. But that's hard wire. That is hard wire. So they still have that option. Right now, it just depends on the location of the system. So there's certain sections of that system that I'm trying to transition to wireless because it doesn't make sense to maintain it any longer. And that, those are the people that I'm trying to target right now and get off that. Why would, why would we not require new tie-ins to be wireless? So it's a double-edged sword because we're trying to keep them on the municipal system. You don't want them going to a third party? Correct. That's why. How much of a money maker is this for us? I mean, really, what, other than? So approximately 113 master boxes and just under $34,000. So the, the, not, the, not a lot of money as far as that goes. And, uh, so if they were to go to a third party, there's some revenue that we lose, but again, it's not significant. It's not significant. And then what do we have for uh, stipends that we pay for our fire alarm? Uh, seven and a half percent. So, 5% stipend and a 2.5% stipend. Right. So, okay. Our income is $34,000, approximately. Approximately. And we're not mandating new tie-ins. It just depends on the location of that tie-in. Yeah, but the it fee isn't supposed to be a revenue generating <coughs> endeavor for us. It's supposed to be just yeah, be commensurate with the, what it costs us to manage but, but these. What I'm trying to get is if we don't require, if we're looking to, to adjust the fee structure in order to encourage people to tie in, why is it that we're not requiring new tie ins to go the route we want? So well, it seems it's, like it's uh, rather expensive. Than, if you just say this because we don't want to go to a third party, I'm not, you know, to me, anybody wants to tie in now, they should be going to this new technology rather than. I can tell you that all new all new businesses right now have agreed to go to wireless master boxes. So that has been oh, has been good. Um, it's been very agreeable and successful so far. And while I have not come out and made it in order that all new times will be that way, everybody that we've encouraged to go that way for the arguments that you know we would discuss here have agreed to do. It. So it's recommended by you. Uh, Highly. Okay. Are you <laughs> and to me, either you're transitioning to this, you know, for those that are tied in, you're encouraging them to transition by giving them a break. But the new ones, you can still give them a choice and you're going to be chasing them to transition later on so they get a break later on. To me, it's new tie-ins should be last. Otherwise, they'd be eligible for a break from the fee as you're encouraging them to do so later on. Seems like this is the chief's first step to try to achieve no, no, that. Right. That's right. What do what do third parties charge? What do they charge? So I'm I'm not sure. I think they're I mean they they vary. It just mm -hmm. depends on the company. So I think I've seen EDT at 19.95 a, a month. I I don't know what their fee structure is. 
I know that the municipal system is instantaneous, and I feel very comfortable in saying that, and we get notified immediately. Well, yeah, yeah. no, there, there's a definite advantage to it. I would think, and again, even if we could price ourselves to be competitive that way and encourage those people to go from the third parties to wireless with us, that makes more sense. Right. Um, you know, those, get the fee to a price point where you're competing with the third parties. It's better for the property owners because there's an immediate response, no third party, you know, uh, Exactly. It's from a safety standpoint, it just makes all, makes all the sense in the world to stay on the system. So, I would think insurance companies that insure their properties would like that too. I am sure that they do, and I'm sure that they get a discount because of that. I bet you that's the case. Wow, this is a really informative discussion. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Okay. Great. Are we all? Uh, Mr. Earlier, are you all set with this? Well, sure. I'll embrace it, but I think we should go further. <laughs> That's the next step. We can talk about that. <laughs> it seems like the Chief's on that kind of a plan, planning. Yeah. Uh, one that chunk, is the trajectory. One chunk at a time, mm -hmm. yeah. You are on board, Mr. Early, I'm Mr. Good. Walner, Mr. Yep. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, me too. So thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Very thank, much. you. thank you. All right. We have one last one, but it looks like it's still blank. So it are is, we yes. wait, still waiting on information for that one? I'm not sure. We're not waiting on it, but we are working through the language that would, would, would should be recommended to the board. Um, Mr. Sudo, Mr. O'Leary, and I will be talking further with town council on Wednesday morning at our regular wastewater discussion, and I expect we'll have language for consideration at the May 9th meeting. To be clear, though, you know, one of the big things that we are seeking to do here is to eliminate what is currently a requirement for any betterment that the town fund 50% of the cost of a project. So for example, the upcoming wastewater project, that is a significant number. And I don't believe it's our intention to proceed in that fashion. But right now, under our existing betterment bylaw, that would be our only option. So that's definitely a change that we need to bring forward for consideration here, along with potential other um, structural recommendations for a betterment program that we will work through between now and the next meeting. Okay, that's a that's a doozy. So we need to see that and have all the pieces of that reviewed too. The Sistine Chapel didn't come into focus in one day. Okay. An interesting comparison. All right, <laughs> but that's okay. I get it. We're delusional. All right. Now I have one quick question for you. Did you talk me. about? some funding for for um, the forest committee is that something that we're going to see somewhere else it was the forest committee that for the five there was a martin's pond item did didn't we talk about that we or was that, about that. Is that on the butt in the regular no. budget or I'm not sure what we're it was five thousand for milfoil, and then there was another discussion we had at strategic planning on dredging. Mm -hmm. There was the researching that. The yeah, that's, that's, yeah, but that that was probably for another day. But we, we yeah. talked about um, last year, two years ago, when we appropriated some money for the, the milfoil and stuff like yeah. that, twenty-five thousand dollars. We strongly suggested to the administration that they get incorporated into somebody's budget, the BW budget on an annual basis rather than having to go back to town meeting yeah. to maintain uh, the treatment as needed. And again, That's for Martin's up, they, haven't, they haven't used up all the 25,000, I understand. I don't think so. Yeah. I'm sorry, I think I said Swan Pond, and I meant Martin's yeah, Pond. Martin's we were talking about Martin's Pond. Yeah. So, so But yes, when we appropriate the 25,000, we encourage the administration to appropriate whatever money is necessary to maintain the, the treatments rather than having to go back every three years right. you know, for Right. An article for $25,000. And then we talked about the strategic planning, looking into dredging. So they're still not ready with yeah. that. Oh, that Chief, before you leave, just Thanks. What's it? Hey, just take some liberty here. I do the business. I was going to offer our condolences in the past of uh, retired deputy chief, uh, Ralph J. Jack Sweetland. Uh, again, a long time uh, member, 40 year plus member of. Uh, Harvard, who passed away just the past week. Jack, I believe, too, is a lifelong resident of the community, uh, but an active member of the community, and certainly an active and important of our uh, firefighter unit in uh, the department, one of the first, first or second permanent firefighters that will be appointed to the North Reading full time firefighters. 
appointed to the North Reading Fire Department. Um, I went to the ranks, but then I was in the Marine Corps for Korean War, came back, volunteer firefighter, and then got back on permanently in 1974, became the deputy chief. At one point was acting chief. His father before him was the chief. Um, but again, uh, uh, condolences to uh, everybody down at the fire department because uh, Jack is a, a good friend and mentor to many down there and uh, a great member of the member to the community. And uh, we mourn his passing along with the firefighters. So, uh, glad you were here. Uh, part of my own little business. And uh, okay. thank you very much. I really, I just want to take a minute and say thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm going to pass it on to his family and also to the department. So it means a lot to us. Um, Jack was a good man, and uh, it, it, it was a, a tragic loss for us and, and also for his family. So um, I really appreciate that, and uh, I'll pass it on. Please do. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to wait on the dredging then. We're going to wait and see on that, right? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Walner. So I've asked the committee to go try to find a consultant who can advise us on okay. this because there's controversy involved with dredging, but there's also, I've asked them to focus on the science. Just tell us the science, find somebody who can tell us about the science, and let's decide from there. Let's worry about the controversies afterwards. So they have to find a consultant who's had experience doing this before. They'll bring that forward, and they, they promise to bring that forward. That'll take time. That'll take months to sort out to find somebody. I'm okay. Sure. Won't so, be so, so in other words, October. nothing on the radar yet. It won't be on this one. It'll be October. Okay. All right. So we're moving along to the next order of business, which is to review the board meeting schedule. Ah, schedule. We'll probably <laughs> skip that one. What do you have for us? What are we scheduled up to? What do you have for us so far, Mr. Last one we had. We were scheduled to yeah. um, today, and I think we had discussed the next meeting being an organizational meeting next Wednesday, the third. Oh Wednesday the fourth. Sorry, the fourth. Excuse me. Um, oh, I have that. What was that? No, I think we we talked. Didn't we talk about the Wednesday after election? Yes, Wednesday. That is the Wednesday after election. The May fourth. Yes. 6 p.m.? That's when we traditionally have held that meeting, yes. Unless there's a wild card write in, folks. <laughs> hey, we're going to things that like we know the players more than likely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, is it a week? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Does that work for everybody? I think we had already planned that. That's our very fast meeting only Shit. orders to <coughs> so next up we had that's at six did you say when we said six does that work for everybody oh, six, six o'clock yeah. um, can we can we do six thirty six thirty all right with everybody six thirty is fine this, that's my day in Lexington. I never know what I'm going to be in traffic. Okay. Obviously, here. What is what is flag? Is that how it works, Madam Chair? What is flag? Yeah. 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 I like it. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Should I have another party in my house? Again? <laughs> okay. Last time I did that. So then after that, now we're working into back, we're backing into town meetings. So we need to have some set. And then we need to figure out if we're really talking about an independent meeting, we really need to have some workshops on that. That I'm assuming all the members are going to want to attend for the, for the sewer project. But let's just. Um, Figure out the meetings through town meeting. Well, I heard the night already mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> town I meeting is on June 6th. Yeah. Right, town meeting's on June 6th. June 6th, June 6th yes. We need to set the, we need to vote on and get the warrant out. May 9th was our intention for that. Everybody sure. all set for May 9th? Yeah. yeah. And then May 23rd, 
would be the warrant article informational hearing where the public is invited to learn more about the warrant articles and offer comment on them in advance of town meeting. <coughs> May 30th is the Memorial Day holiday, and then June 6th would be the town meeting. So between the 9th and the 23rd, are we, are we meeting on the 23rd? That would be my recommendation, then. <coughs> um, I won't be able to come to the meeting on the 23rd. Could meet on the 16th, Madam Chair. Back-to-back uh, -back weeks, if that works better for the for the board. Either That's fine with me. I don't work for me. Does that work for Is work that all right with everybody? Sixteenth and not the twenty-third. Yes. Okay. All right. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, the warrant won't have arrived to people's homes uh -huh. on, the, on the 16th. We'll be signing it on the 9th. It'll get printed and mailed the 19th or 20th, arriving the 21st and 23rd. So, so that, might, that might be challenging. Okay. So why don't we keep it to the 23rd and... Whoever the chair is. <laughs> so the chairs and the vice chairs can handle the to the you know, can do handle the meeting. No, I go a day later. I can't do Tuesday. Tuesdays no. Yeah. Wednesday the twenty fifth. That week's just outside of Monday. And um, let me see if between now and the next meeting I can move some things around and then maybe then just. Yeah, are they going to be publishing anything though? Um, no, we won't submit the warrant to the printer until after the night. What about public hearings and things like that? The one that will be after the night? They would be after, yeah. The, the next hearing that we would be advertising to Mount Jet Ryu is the, um, the budget hearing mm -hmm. on May 9th. So if oh. you can jump juggle I'm okay with Tuesday or Wednesday I, I, if anything it's going to be Tuesday I just have to move I can something. do that if you, if you can juggle are you okay, are you okay in the 24th? oh you're not doesn't matter oh. doesn't matter okay, okay. Tuesdays are then out don't, don't Tuesdays juggle even okay. <laughs> that's a bad week okay right. mm, why is there a bad, what? bad week the CPC weeks on that Tuesday. You what? I think the CPC weeks on that Tuesday. Okay, we're, we're going to keep it to Monday. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, another op option, Madam Chair, through you is the, the Memorial Day week, either Tuesday or Wednesday of that, of that week. If we wanted to have the hearing when all five board members could, could be here and have the warrant in hand. Another reason why that Tuesday doesn't work is I think that is the EDC event. The 24th I have, yeah. is that right? So I can't make Tuesday, so yeah. uh, you'll be without me on mm -hmm. a Tuesday anyway. So now, actually, I gotta rearrange for that, okay. So do you, can you do Wednesday, May 1st for the? Wednesday, June May, first. June, June 1st. June 1st. <laughs> Okay. It's all right. We're, we're, we got you back. Don't Wednesday, June 1st. Does that work? You mean instead of the... Instead of the 23rd, right? I mean yeah. The 30th is Memorial Day. That's why we're... Right. Yeah. We're yeah. not... That's right. So let's say, where is that ABC event going to be? I will be able to tell you after tomorrow's meeting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tomorrow, we're, that was going to be part of my uh, board member report that we're uh, just floating around a few things tomorrow and then we'll Just know but it'll be local 
Uh, local. It, it was local. I can tell you that. It's, it's in North Reading. Okay. I would hope so. I'm just saying back it is. to the meeting. Can we right. do June 1st instead of the 21st? I can do June 1st. You can. Well, my pool's yeah, opening June 1st. Is that in addition to the 23rd? It would instead of the 23rd. Okay. June 1st instead of May 23rd. Everybody can do that. Is that okay going so long between meetings? Well, this is that gonna matter? really to review the war. It's, it's, a it's an information. It's a hearing. Wednesday, yeah. We're our what we're doing there is just reviewing the <coughs> having them basically holding a pre public hearing on the tab, the warrant articles for That's public correct. input. That's correct. Yes. So it's really a okay. limited focus, I would say, on that meeting. And then we can assign warrant articles when we vote on the 9th. Mm -hmm. So if the members are available June 1st, does that work for everybody? That works. Yep. And that's at 7, Michael? Whatever the pleasure of the board. Uh, that We've got an executive session stuff. Hmm. Uh, so we're deleting the 23rd. Right. Killing the 23rd. Okay, so we'll go. We'll so 9th and then June 1st. That's good. Yeah. Wow. It'll all be March I'll miss March you guys. Why? <laughs> It'll be a long time before. in between. Mm -hmm. Do we need, really? do we, should we work on June? We know we meet before in advance of the town meeting for anything that's left to vote, but it doesn't seem like they'll do too much other than the budget. We, should, we hope to have all of that concluded for you on, on the 9th. Surely you, you'd have it on the 1st, by the 1st. Yes. And don't call me Shirley. So, <laughs> so. surely, you, surely, we, we could even maybe take a vote on it. We're going to start calling Liz Shirley. <laughs> Shirley. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Little airplane oh, reference liver. there. All right. So after the town meeting, do we want to keep going? Yes. Let's go. Uh, we have <coughs> Juneteenth on the 20th, so that's out. Yes. Why do I have the 13th? Is that wrong? <laughs> yes, that's wrong. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, God. There it is. Madam Chair, through you, customarily in June, we've met the evening of town meeting. Which is then, the 6th. And then the third Monday of the month. Which is a holiday. Because it's a holiday. Which is a holiday. Our options were either to meet on the 13th, which oh, is the week after town meeting, or Tuesday the 21st. She can't do Tuesday. Or she can't Wednesday do the 22nd. Or, and this is not my recommendation because now it's getting really late in June, the 27th of June as well. So. Keeping in mind that that meeting normally is a water rate hearing, and that is our expectation. So the 13th. The 13th like works for me. But I, <coughs> I already had it in my schedule for some apparent reason. <laughs> I'm a little so psychic, Does everybody have the 13th? Yep. All right. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, does that work for you? Okay. We're getting into the months where Mr. O'Leary's planning director will take over his schedule. I can tell you right now that the week of the 16th, 17th, the 18th of July. July. Well, if we just keep to the 13th, and then if we are able to do that, I don't even want to say this out loud, but if since we're planning, if we can do one month, one, one, that's two meetings in June, keeping in mind town meeting. Maybe July and August we meet once to. Art, I mean. Is that possible? You think we need two August for a sewer? As we get closer. Yeah. yeah but we can we can schedule that. Just off the cuff. And if we get closer, we can talk about meetings devoted just for those mm -hmm. It's gonna be awesome. So do we? So no meeting on the twenty seventh of June. No. Okay. Correct. We'll Do you have a best Monday in July we can lock in now 
Mr. Gilberto? Uh, I hadn't gone that far out uh, in, in the scheduling. My wife's due date is July 27th. You know, oh. since this is the reoccurring theme for the select board to take into account my personal, uh, oh. you know, babies that are just born all the time well, at the studio house. <laughs> so just so exciting. They just appear. How about the 11? There's things you can do about that, you know. You, <laughs> you want to get Allison back in? Embrace it, roll ways. with it, and enjoy. I'm because gonna, uh, in a blink of an eye, they're you know out of the house. How about the 11? Yeah, my money's worth If his long. wife wants more babies, there is not it's anything happening. you can do about that. But yeah, just so you know. So. <laughs> Let's talk about July this. So Let's keep it to board business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Even though we're the only ones. Are still on. I can do July 11th as of now. Let's. Oh, that's true. I can do that. Fair. As of now. Well, let's lock it in. If 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 we're doing, uh, if we're trying to lock in, at least lock in one meeting a month or in the summer months, given that we're. <coughs> I, I have to check with my social director because I may not be available. <laughs> All right. July 11th. Yeah. So we'll keep, we'll just tentatively hold it, but you tell us if we need to change it. Sure. And um, let's try to lock in one in August. So. So we're going to do the 18th, just in case. Not the 15th. What do you, no, I think we put in the 11th. Does that work? For what? July? July 11th. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, no, I can do the 11th. Yeah, that's fine. You want to do August 8th? I can do the 8th. Okay. Does that work, Mr. Gilbert, the 8th? I'll have to check with the social director. <laughs> All right. I didn't do my homework, Madam Chair. Apologies. Well, you probably didn't anticipate we were going to try to lock. So we'll in. put it in, and if we need to change it, we will. You'll just let us know. We'll revisit the schedule as we're instructed by our various spouses. Mm -hmm. What's happening? All right. right. Sounds good. Before Liz leaves, I just wanted to say I think we share a birthday. My work is with. Oh, I knew it was close. All right, so happy birthday you to you. The, you yeah. do have the same uh, nail polish on. <laughs> yes. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. I learned. Okay. That was the important thing. So we're good as far as that mainly completed schedule. So legal bills, a uh, next order of business. Or we'll rifle through them. Yes, please. Well, this is one. Sorry, I thought these are minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for April 2022 in the amount of 6398.75 for GIS Consulting 20 Elm Street litigation. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Minutes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes of the January 24, 2022 executive session minutes as written. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. <coughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam yes. Chair, I move to approve the minutes of the February 7, 2022 regular session meeting as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes of the February 7, 2022 executive session Meeting is written. Okay. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes of March 28, 2022. Regular session meeting is written. Okay. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. She forgot this. Oh, give it to Mike. Okay. As long as I sign, I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes of the March 28, 2022 executive session meeting as written. Second. Thank you. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 That's it.
<laughs> April. We just did that. No. No, we had March. That's all I got. I don't have the April one. I Am I supposed to have April? Wait, Maybe she didn't print the motion, the, but uh, I doubt it. April 11th. Yeah, I don't. Hold on. Let me go in the oh, packet. You don't because they're not complete. I apologize. I don't because they're they, not complete. They made complete. it to the agenda, but the minutes were not quite 100% there. So okay. we're all set for those tonight. You're really dying to approve those minutes, huh? Yes, <laughs> ahead of schedule. Okay. Next order of business is the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. First, um, while it was not in my written report, we had some uh, developments over the weekend and into today with the scheduled uh, road construction to take place on Upper Elm Street between Elm and Washington and Haverhill Street, which is the site of a significant amount of drainage work done last construction season. <coughs> so we just urge the motoring public to be aware that that road is anticipated to be um, basically reclaimed down to dirt um, tomorrow, as soon as tomorrow, we send out the reverse, the reverse 911 to the neighborhood. We've been informing the school bus routes as well. And uh, we'll work with uh, JRM to try to make sure the trash collection can occur. Uh, but there will be a disruption in that neighborhood and it's certainly a sign of progress as we get through that project. Um, but I just want folks to be aware of that. And then shortly thereafter, most likely on Wednesday, uh, Mount Vernon Street will go through the same thing. Uh, we're all aware of the situation there with the water main work that was done, and now it's time to uh, prepare for paving. So there will be a significant disruption in those neighborhoods in terms of just the work happening, but also the condition of the road afterwards while we're awaiting the, uh, the repaving to be uh, occurring. And that will take some time, um, and we'll provide an update as, uh, as things move along. But uh, we had an opportunity to get on the schedule with the contractor, we obviously want these projects to move forward. So I just let folks know that that construction is going to be happening. Um, and I believe it's been put out on social media to the police department. Um, and I think through the DPW today, as well as that reverse 911 that I mentioned. <coughs> to go, my, go to my regular report, uh, following up on the conversations I had with Congressman Bolton's office, I submitted two projects for consideration for congressionally directed funding to Senators Warren and Markey. $1.5 million for the final wastewater design for our main park and Concord Street um, project, and $1.5 million for the wastewater collection system to connect the historic and other municipal buildings in the center of town to the Middle High School wastewater treatment plant, um, hoping that we will succeed in one um, of those uh, applications. And then finally, I included a copy of the report submitted by the town planner to the state regarding um, the MBTA Communities Program, again, another step in that process as we continue to um, look at you know, where we might or might not fit into that program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? All right, let's move on to board member reports and all the new business. We typically do that together. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, I've heard the first, uh, passing of the Chief of Sweetland, I plan this family. Um, other than that, I just would encourage everybody to go out and vote next week. We'll have a lot at stake, and uh, to my colleagues, I wish you all the luck and no hard work. as we counted last year, the last week of the campaign. But uh, that's the luck. Look forward to uh, serving with you for another term. And again, encouraging everybody to get out and vote. So, I believe there's a lot at stake in this particular election when it comes to this whole community. So please get out there and vote. Be heard. Perfect. Mr. Walner. Yeah, you've already heard a lot of my things tonight, but I'll uh, remind the public that the last public forum for the candidates is tomorrow night, at, uh, excuse me, Wednesday night at Kitty's. Um, and I would encourage you to go listen in. If you can't, if you can't do that, uh, it starts at 7.10, something like that. Um, when, oh, Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Okay, I thought yeah, you said I tomorrow night. Tuesday, but Wednesday night. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously the focus is on the school committee. But I think you'll be there as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, so we'll be available for questions as well. So I encourage you to go. Thank you. All right. Mr. Um, Studo. The EDC is meeting tomorrow to finalize the location for our event Tuesday the 24th. Um, you know, we, did, we had a lot of traction with it last, last year. 
Um, you know, I think people are excited to get out, but this time around we're going to you know, be having a lot of conversation about some of the bigger projects coming to a theater near you. So, uh, but I'll have more info on our May 9th meeting for that. All right, all set? Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, apologize that I was not at the last candidate night because I was out of town on a scheduled vacation. So um, I apologize for not being there, but I will be at the Wednesday night one. Um, CIT, I still wanted to talk about. I've been talking every meeting about the programs they have going on. They're coming to an end, but they're still going. Strong families, resilient kids. 40 assets to build strong kids. There is still some one hour sessions. Um, that ends May 11th. So you can find that information on their Facebook page, their website, um, northreadingmass.gov slash CIT. Um, they're also still doing the Narcan training. Um, there's still one left, April 28th, which I encourage everybody to do. Um, guiding Good Choices, Skill Building for Parents. There is one left, April 27th, Youth Substance Use and Mental Health 101. And there's also a DEA National Rx Take Back a drive-through at the Edith O'Leary Senior Center, Saturday, April 30th from 10 to 2, um, where you can get rid of any old prescription drugs that you have, and that includes pet meds also, um, that you can just drive through and get rid of those. Um, so that is my CI Community Impact Team report. Um, and I think that's all I have. Thank you. I just want to, I think it was stated May 3rd is the election. I'm, I wanted to, I'm getting questions and I, I just looked myself. I don't see this information readily accessible from the town clerk. Even if it's a no answer for people, is it too late to register for the, to be on, to vote? May 3rd and are the absentee ballots available and when's the last day to vote to pick up uh, an absentee ballot if you're unavailable for the for the election on May 3rd. So we'll have to get that information put on the website. You know, on I Facebook. can't see that and, and I, I recognize that it should probably even though it was presented to us it, it's just information that I would assume is posted up there immediately accessible when one is looking for town election information, it's not there. You could it, it, there's a link to register, mm -hmm. but it's not clear any of that. Those those deadlines are not even on there, and I, I am being asked that. So, if you don't mind, Mr. Gilbert, at least emailing us or texting us so that we can have it and and getting it posted because if people are at the last minute thinking they can register and vote or at the last minute thinking they are eligible to get an absentee ballot. I, I don't, I'm not sure because it's not up there. So I think this election generated a pretty significant amount of public interest. So I'm sure it was printed in the transcript. But again, if people are going to our own website, it should be readily accessible. It should even be on a banner on the, on the home page, all of that information. Even if it's too late to pick up an absentee ballot, it should be on there. If it's, you can register to vote and that's encouraged, but you, you won't be on the listing, that should be stated there so people know that. We'll get that posted, Madam Chair. Great. And I, I used up my board member comments, at least at the beginning. So looking forward to finalizing budget work and with the committee and getting that moving along and reporting back on what happens with the CIPC meeting on the vote on those projects as well. Motion to adjourn. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. Second. Motion by Mr. O'Leary, second by, motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. Madam Chair. You found it? I didn't find it, but it was sent to me. <laughs>
Great. I, uh, we were mid vote. Before we adjourn, <laughs> uh, pause the vote. The deadline to register to vote was May, uh, was, excuse me, April 13th. Wednesday, April 13th. Okay. And I so, want to thank the transcript for providing that. She actually said it to me earlier, but I'm I sure she it posted it, yes. I'm sure it was in there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but again, people are asking, and I'm sure the candidates are going to get fielded with these questions as well. And when did she tell you one? She did not. <laughs> so I think we should put it in a banner, you know, here is the information about the upcoming election that someone can just go right to the home page and click into it, you know. Current events, you know, or something like that. Sure thing. Because um, I forget what the town clerks mentioned, but if it's too late to vote in this election, people should still register to vote so they can vote in the next anyway. But, all right. We had a motion Aye. by Mr. Studer, a second by, I'm sorry, Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.